Okay, uh, we will get started. So in the previous lecture, we were talking about KKT theorem and KKT theorem gave, gave us uh, necessary conditions for optimality uh, for inequality constrained problem. So we are interested in minimizing fx such that hx is equal to 0 and gx is less than equal to 0. So we talked about regular points and if a point is regular and local minimum, then it satisfies a bunch of conditions. <coughs> Let me remind you the definition for active constraints. So A of X is the set of J 1 to R such that GJ of X is equal to 0. So that was uh, the set of active constraints. And in the KKT theorem, we said that if a point is local minimum and uh, regular, then the first derivative of Lagrangian is zero and the second derivative satisfies certain conditions. So today we want to talk about sufficient conditions aspect of uh, this optimality thing. What I mean by that is, uh, under what conditions would a point x bar and the corresponding Lagrange multiplier pairs, lambda star, lambda bar, and mu bar, would be optimal? So in order to do that, let me first introduce the notion of Lagrangian for this case. It is denoted by L and it's a function of x, lambda, and mu. So x is in Rn, lambda is in Rm, and mu is greater than or equal to 0, mu is in Rr. It's a function of x, lambda, and mu, and it's given by f of x plus lambda transpose h of x plus mu transpose g of x. Okay. So the question now is what's the sufficient conditions for optimality? Under what conditions, if I have x bar, lambda bar, and mu bar, uh, how can I ascertain that x bar is actually the local minimum and lambda bar and mu bar are the corresponding Lagrange multiplier pairs for that x bar? So let's look into that. Okay, so I have, suppose x bar, lambda bar, mu bar satisfies a whole bunch of conditions. The first condition is The first derivative of Lagrangian with respect to x evaluated at the point is equal to 0. And the point is a x bar is a feasible point. So it lies on the surface hx equal to 0 and it satisfies g of x bar less than equal to 0. Mu 
mu j bar has to be non-negative. <coughs> The third is mu bar j is equal to 0 for all j that is not an active constraint at x bar. Okay, so so far we have just we are just mimicking the steps of KKT theorem, I mean just the conclusion of KKT theorem here. So even in that situation, the first derivative of Lagrangian should be 0, mu j, bar, mu j star should be greater than or equal to 0, mu j star should be equal to 0 for all constraints that are inactive. The fourth one is also very similar. Okay. So if you go back to KKT theorem, you will realize that these four conditions were there, except for in the fourth condition, I've added a small change. So my D transpose second derivative of Lagrangian D is strictly greater than zero for all D that is first order feasible variation at X bar, but D is not equal to zero. So this part was not there in the KKT theorem and this was greater than or equal to 0 K in, the, in, that, in the KKT theorem. So there is a slight change here and there is a major change here which says that mu bar j is greater than 0 for all j in Ax bar. So this is a major change. This was not there in KKT theorem but it's there in this particular uh, in the sufficient condition case. So if all these five conditions are satisfied, then X bar is a local minimum and lambda bar, mu bar are Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so this is the sufficient condition for optimality. Now remember in the previous lecture, we were talking about a convex problem. We had a convex objective function with a linear constraint and we had computed a candidate optimal solution in the previous class. By candidate optimal solution, what I mean is we computed an X star and a mu star that satisfies all the uh, necessary conditions for optimality and because they satisfy the necessary condition for optimality, they are just candidate solution, they are not optimal. There is no way for us to know whether they are optimal or not. However, if you go back and uh, look at the uh, X, X star and mu star pair, it actually satisfies all these five conditions and therefore, now, after knowing this result, the sufficient condition for optimality, we are uh, uh, assured that that particular X star is a local minimum and the mu star we computed is the Lagrange multiplier for that particular problem. 
Okay? So in today's class, we have been able to prove that what we computed in the previous class is actually a locally optimal solution. We haven't yet talked about global optimality. It's just about local optimality. It's a local minimum. For global minimum, we have to wait for another one month. Okay? But at least we know that it's a local minimum. What we computed was a local minimum for that particular problem. Okay? And the key difference here is this fifth part. I mean, of course, fourth is different in the sense that we require strict positivity here when d is not equal to zero. And, and that has some implications in the proof. But this one is actually the most important addition to the set of conditions in the sufficient condition case. So the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to active constraints have to be strictly positive. Yes, please. We could, because I just wanted to juxtapose that these are there in the KKT theorem, oh. and this is a new one here. But yes, you can, you can of course, add 2, 3, and 5 in the same condition, and that should be fine. OK. Let's look at an example where this fifth condition is not satisfied and we know that it, that particular point is not an optimal solution. So the problem is as follows. I want to minimize half of x1 square minus x2 square and x2 is less than or equal to 0. x in Rn. Can someone tell me what x star is going to be like for this problem? Oh, I should probably put a zero. So x star should be 0, 0. Anyone else has a different x star in mind? So you have to notice that this is a negative sign here, right? Yes, please. Wouldn't it just be x to infinity? infinity? Yes, negative infinity, that's right. So you could put any a here and negative infinity here, and it's a feasible point. Right? Actually, in this problem, there is no minimum, right? So it should be infimum. But anyways, we can let's assume that minus infinity is part of the real line, in which case the solution here would be x star is negative infinity and x1 could be x2 is negative infinity and x1 could be any real number, a. a is an r. OK. And the value here is negative infinity. Now here is the deal. x star equals to 0, 0, and mu star equals to 0 satisfies KKT conditions. So if I pick x star and mu star, like I mentioned, necessary conditions for optimality, it means nothing in the world of optimization. So here I have a, a point and the corresponding Lagrange multiplier, which satisfies the KKT conditions for optimality. But it's, it's nothing. That point is just a saddle point, actually, in this case. So it's, it's, uh, it's it's not useful, 
but if you if you look at the set of sufficient conditions it satisfies one two three let's see if it satisfies the fourth one so I need to figure out what V of X star is going to be so I want to still look at this particular X star mu star pair and I want to show that four uh, actually five would not be satisfied four would still be satisfied so let's look into it so this is D such that gradient of gj which is 0 1 d equals to 0 uh, which means d such that d2 is equal to 0 right so this is my gradient of gj x star transpose d equals to 0 term And my gj of x star is, or in this case, there is only one j. So that is just x2. That's it. So the derivative of gj would be 0, 1. And transpose d equals to 0, which means d2 is equal to 0. OK? Everyone agrees with this? This is my V of X star? Any questions on the derivation of V of X star? OK. So I'm going to erase this part. And so I have, I have to compute the second derivative of X star and mu star, which is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And then mu star is 0. So the second derivative of g2 is 0. So therefore, that term doesn't appear. And so d transpose 1, 0, 0, minus 1, d is greater than 0 for d not equal to 0, and d is in vx star. <clears throat> Actually, let's, let me just show you why this is the case. So this is d1 square minus d2 square. And note that if d is not equal to 0, d is in vx star, then it means that d1 is not equal to 0 and d2 is equal to 0. And this implies that d1 square minus d2 square is, not, is strictly positive. <coughs> Okay, so even four is satisfied for this problem. This is not a positive definite matrix. It's not a positive definite matrix, but it still satisfies this condition. Because it only needs to be satisfied for the first order feasible variation, not over the entire space. Okay. Any other question? D is not equal to zero. Uh, does that mean that D1 and D2 should not be equal to zero? Not really, because uh, so a vector is non zero if any element is non zero. Oh, okay. Right? So in this case, D2 has to be equal to zero. That's part of V of X star. So the only element is D1, which can be non zero. So that is non zero. OK. So this point, x star and mu star, x star equals to 0, mu star equals to 0, satisfies 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay, All four conditions, all four sufficient conditions are satisfied. Let's check the fifth sufficient condition. Oh, actually, fifth is easy to check. Okay, So 
the fourth is satisfied fifth mu star has to be greater than zero for all active constraint so when x2 star is equal to zero the constraint is active but mu star is equal to zero so mu star is equal to zero even though g of x star is equal to zero so five is not satisfied okay five is not satisfied so the fifth condition is actually a very important condition in the set of sufficient conditions for optimality okay so x star equals to 0 and mu star equals to 0 is not a locally minimum solution is it's not a local minimum because it doesn't satisfy the sufficient conditions well actually that statement is incorrect so there is no way for us to guarantee that this is a local minimum because it it fails the sufficient conditions for optimality okay let me remind you any any question on this before i move on to the next topic okay so let me remind you something from the earlier class maybe like lecture 5 or something this is the set of all points x this is the set of points that satisfies the necessary conditions for optimality this is the set of points that satisfies the th these are the points that are optimal and these are the points that satisfy sufficient conditions for optimality so we know that this particular point x star and mu star it lies here and it doesn't lie here so how do we know whether it's optimal or not well actually at this point of time there is nothing that allows us to conclude that this is not optimal it fails the sufficient conditions but it could still be here and it satisfies the necessary condition so it could be here or it could be here it could be in any of these two uh, sets but uh, of course in this problem by inspection we know that it's not optimal because there is no optimal solution to the optimization problem but that's by inspection and one of the reasons why i give you these high dimensional optimization problems to solve is so that your intuition doesn't work on that problem okay so you really have to solve it using the stuff taught in the class and not use your intuition to solve them so in this problem we have the intuition that this point is not an optimal solution but in general it's very difficult if it fails the sufficient condition it's very difficult for you to ascertain whether the point sits here or whether the point sits here but that's what it is okay life is hard okay any question so far perfect so the next topic i want to talk about is sensitivity theorem and it has sensitivity has a lot of applications in uh, in economics and i work a lot on optimization with economics because I, I study electricity markets and I study transportation markets in my research so we use sensitivity theorem quite a lot in our in my research and that's why I want to share the excitement about sensitivity theorem here so what is this theorem So let's consider the following problem. I want to minimize f of x such that h of x is equal to u and g of x is less than or equal to v. And I'm going to call the output to be p of u comma v.
Okay, so I have an optimization problem and I have perturbed the constraints a little bit. Perturbed, okay, perturbation is the key here. So this u is some small number, 0 0.01 minus 0 0.01, something like that. And this v is again a small number, like 0 0.01 or minus 0 0.01, okay? I have perturbed this problem, these constraints, and I look at the same objective function, I want to minimize it, and I want to call it p, which is a function of u and v, which is a function of the perturbations I have done to the constraint set. Now let's assume that x star, now what is x star? So x star is when u is equal to 0 and v is equal to 0. So let me write it as x star of 0, 0, uh, lambda star of 0, 0, mu star of 0, 0. So u is equal to 0 and v is equal to 0 is optimal and regular and satisfies sufficient conditions, so these sufficient conditions. Let me write that the solutions here are x star u comma v, lambda star u comma v, and mu star u comma v. That's the solution for this particular problem. Okay, so if I make this assumption, which is at zero, zero, at the optimal solution with no perturbation, the set of solution and Lagrange multiplier pairs, uh, it's, it's a regular, X star is a regular point and they all satisfy the sufficient conditions for optimality, these five conditions for optimality. Then, X star, lambda star, mu star are differentiable functions and also p star, not p star but p and p are differentiable and the most important point gradient of u p zero zero equals to minus lambda star zero zero gradient of v p at zero zero is equal to minus mu star of zero zero So I want you to notice the negative sign here. Okay. This P is the optimal value of this constraint optimization problem. So P is equal to F of X star of U comma V. Yes, please. Why can't we uh, like subtract the u or subtract the v and make it so we have like some new hx equal to zero and some new gx less than or equal to zero and then just receive the kkt theorem? 
uh, that's a good point. So the reason why we don't want to do that is because we don't want to perturb the entire function h. We only want to perturb the constant part of h, whatever the constant part be. So that's the best way to write it. Yeah. Because arguably, I could perturb h in this fashion. So my h, OK, I have to delete something. Uh, I'm going to delete the sufficient conditions now. So the, the way you are uh, arguing, like you want to write the perturbation of h itself, I could have h of x as x squared minus 5. And I could have h tilde of x as 1.01 .01 x squared minus 5.02. Right? So we don't want this kind of perturbation. This is also a perturbation of h, but we don't want this kind of perturbation. We only want the perturbation in the constant term, not in the, the rest of the terms that might be contained in h. Well, what about the first h of x you wrote equal like 30, and, and then you just subtract the 30? That wouldn't affect the x squared, would it? So that would be like if this is equal to 30, it's the same as writing 35. So you are just changing the constant in the function, yeah. But how does that impact the x squared? Sorry, I'm, I'm not able to get your question. So I have this constraint, h of x equal to 0, right? right? And you are saying that I could. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just wondering why in this insensitivity theorem, we have h of x equals u. Right. You can't just subtract the u because it's only going to affect the constant terms Correct. in h of x. Correct. OK, so if I, I have to call this function something else, right? Yeah. What am I going to call it? H tilde? Yeah. Okay. Right? So all I'm saying is the H tilde differs from H only in the constant term. But if I write it more generally, more generally as H tilde here, then it means that I could also change the coefficients. So because I'm only changing the constant, this is the best way to write it. OK, this is the best and easiest way to, to, to explain it to someone else. But if I write it this way and then say that, oh, h tilde and h differs by a constant, then it creates a confusion. OK. Yeah. Any other question? OK. All right. Now let me give you some examples where this is, this sensitivity, is, like it's, it's when the constraints are perturbed slightly. OK, I'll give you some real world examples. So consider the situation of electricity market, which we have worked a lot of, lot of problems on electricity markets now. So you have total supply equals to demand, right? Now there is a demand at this particular instant of time. And let's say I wanted to iron my shirts and I plug in my iron and I perturbed the total demand by 1.5 kilowatts, okay? So that's a perturbation to the existing demand. And that appears here as a small perturbation to the total demand. So the total demand for electricity at this point of time in the state of Ohio would be somewhere of the order of uh, 20,000, maybe, 20, maybe 15,000 gigawatt. That's the total demand right now. And I'm demanding 1,500 kilowatt more, OK? So it's a very small perturbation to the existing supply. And the question is, how should we price? Now that I've plugged in my iron, I need to pay some money for, for demanding that kind of electricity. The way to compute that cost of electricity is through the sensitivity theorem. So what you want to know is how much have I changed the optimal solution by, OK? How much, how much extra uh, cost am I generating by plugging, it, plugging my iron in? And that is computed using lambda star. And this is what the prices for electricity is in the wholesale electricity market. This is how electricity is traded 
in the, in the US at least, and I'm sure it, it's followed across the world. Okay, this is known as competitive equilibrium, and the first person to come up with the notion of competitive equilibrium got a Nobel Prize back in 1970s, maybe 1950s, somewhere in 1950s to 70s. Okay, so it's a Nobel Prize winning theorem in some sense. So that's the economic application. We, in our research, apply it to transportation area as well as, uh, as, well as in the uh, electricity market area. And that's why you see so many examples of electricity market because that's my research topic in some sense. And this is known as marginal cost of production in the context of economics. So this is the marginal cost of production, which is the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to supply equals to demand constraint in the objective in the uh, objective function so in economics we want to minimize costs such that supply is equal to demand okay now that's one example let me give you another example where these constraints are perturbed so consider this situation you are driving a vehicle on the road and it's a free flowing traffic on a highway and somebody from this lane comes into your lane okay now your speed constraints which is an inequality constraint so initially, you wanted your velocity to be less than or equal to 70 miles per hour. Oh, this V is, OK. Let me write it as velocity. <clears throat> you wanted it to be less than 70 miles per hour, but somebody came in front of you. So now, your updated velocity limit is 68 miles per hour. Because you don't want to crash into that person, so you want to slow down a little bit. That's a small perturbation to your uh, constraint and if you wanted to drive in the most fuel efficient way you have to resolve this optimization problem and figure out what's the optimal fuel consumption should be when the constraints are perturbed slightly and once again that information is contained in the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to the equality constraint uh, to the inequality constraint in this case in a very recent <coughs> work, we have actually exploited this connection to come up with very fast algorithms to solve optimization problems of this type. So it's really very fascinating subject because um, in many areas, <coughs> like wind farm control, like autonomous vehicles, or renewable energy production, this Equality constraints and inequality constraints are changing every second, sometimes even in millisecond scale. And the question in front of engineers is, how do you compute the solution as quickly as possible for the new operating condition? And we have actually contributed to that literature by coming up with very fast algorithms to do that um, in the last one year or one and a half years or so. Uh, so it's still an active area of research in our group to exploit this sensitivity theorem to come up with fast algorithms, which wasn't done so far, but, but we are among the first groups to try and do that. <clears throat> okay, so that's why I love sensitivity theorem. It's very, very useful, both from the algorithmic perspective, as well as from the perspective of uh, uh, like economics. And certainly it's uh, the proof of this particular theorem uh, relies on what is known as implicit function theorem, which we haven't studied in this class, so I'm not going to prove it. But again, the proof is uh, somewhat complicated, uh, relies on implicit function theorem, and uh, it's, uh, you can read up the book if you want to learn the proof of this particular result. But that's what sensitivity theorem is. It studies the sensitivity of the optimal value and proves that the sensitivity is equal to negative of the Lagrange multiplier. And the sensitivity is equal to the negative of the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to the inequality constraints. So that's sensitivity theorem. Any questions on this one? Yes, please. How do we like, actually find P of UV from, from This one? Yeah. Excellent question. So. You can't really find P of UV directly, but you can find a first order, uh, uh, first order, what is that called? Uh, approximation. So remember that P of U comma V, zero, zero, 
plus gradient of u that's well it shouldn't be equal to it should be a first order approximation first order taylor approximation of p of uv of course this term is the same as this term and this term is the same as this term So there is an easy way. So if, you, if things are perturbed, there is an easy expression to compute the first order approximation of what the new perturbed solution is going to look like based on the solution that you already know for the unperturbed problem. Any other question? Okay, we still have 10 more minutes. So, uh, so that, that ends uh, chapter three of the book. Uh, I just wanted to cover Lagrange multiplier theorem, KKT theorem, sufficient conditions and sensitivity theorem. In this particular chapter, there's a whole bunch of other theorems that's necessary or sufficient conditions for optimality for different settings. But we have covered the more general ones, which is KKT theorem and the and the Lagrange multiplier theorem. Uh, now we want to exploit this knowledge about necessary conditions for optimality. Uh, we want to exploit this knowledge to come up with algorithms to solve problems of this type, okay? That's the next uh, set of things that we want to worry about or think about. So here is the The next method that we will study, again, now we go back to the algorithmic domain. We are only, we're not going to talk about theory anymore. We'll talk about algorithms. So here is the first algorithm. We will talk about barrier method. And the idea in barrier method is as follows. I have a function minimize the function fx, x is in some complicated set capital X, such that gx is less than or equal to zero. So what we want to do, so here is, here is what happens. So this is my uh, region, gx less than or equal to zero region in the space. And we want to find a solution to the optimization problem of that type. What we are going to do is create a barrier at the points that are at, at the corner points. So at these points, we want to create a barrier. So we come up with a function b of x that looks something like this. This is my b of x. And then I try to solve this following problem. I want to minimize f of x plus epsilon b of x such that x is in capital X. 
and I get x epsilon. Okay. So here is my problem. I have a minimization problem to solve, such that gx is less than or equal to zero. I want to solve this problem, but it has an inequality constraint. I, I know how to solve a problem with no constraints, and I know how to solve a problem with uh, like optimization over convex sets. So we have studied conditional gradient method and manifold suboptimization method and so on and so forth for solving optimization over convex sets. So those things I know. But this particular algorithm, like how do, you, how do you compute this, I don't know. So here is the trick. I'm going to remove this constraint. I'll forget about this constraint. But I'll create a function b of x such that as soon as you start violating the constraint, that function goes to infinity. OK? On both the sides. So, so this is my gx equal, let's say g1 of x equal to 0. This is my g2 of x equals to 0. So as I'm approaching this, this constraint, I'm going to, like the barrier function is going to uh, escape to infinity very quickly. Okay, But in the middle region, it is going to be relatively flat. It's not going to change the value significantly. Now I add that barrier function with an epsilon multiplier. So I multiply epsilon, which is a small number, to b of x. I add the function f of x, and I minimize over the set capital X. Now, in most situations of interest, this capital X would be a convex set, or it could be an unconstrained set, like x could be Rn, or x could be a convex set. If it is a convex set, you know what to do. You already have all the codes written. If it is a unconstrained set, again, you know what to do and you have all the codes written. Uh, so <clears throat> you can solve this minimization problem. You can get the value of x epsilon. And either you output this as a solution to this optimization problem, because it's, it's an approximate solution. This epsilon is a small number. Or alternatively, what you can do is you can reduce the value of epsilon further, start with this initial condition, and resolve the optimization problem, and get a new value of x epsilon for epsilon much smaller than the original epsilon you had picked. So maybe you can start this way. You can start with epsilon equals to 5, solve the problem, change the value of epsilon to 2, solve the problem again, then change the value of epsilon to 0 0.1, solve the problem again, and in the limit, you will actually solve the original problem that you started with. So that's the idea behind barrier method. For this method to work, you need a very specific class of uh, set. So, so let's study what that condition is. <coughs> So let's define S as X in capital X such that GJ of X is less than zero for all J. We can apply this particular approach when the following conditions are met. Every feasible point can be approached
via points in A S Oh, S is non empty. So we have two assumptions here. Okay, so we can implement barrier method under the following conditions. We define a set S such that all the inequality constraints are uh, strictly less than zero for all J. And this set S should be non-empty and any feasible point, which is basically the feasible points are X and X such that g of x is less than equal to 0, any feasible point can be approached via points in S. This particular condition, of course, it's satisfied for most of the problems that you would encounter in your day-to-day -day situation, but what this essentially says is there should be no isolated points. In set capital X. no isolated points at the boundary of the set. Okay, so you can't have a set capital X which looks something like Okay, so if you have isolated points that cannot be reached from within the set capital S, so this shaded region is capital S, and you have these points, isolated points that are sitting outside of capital S, you cannot really approach these points from points within the set capital S. And we want to avoid that situation, that's why we are making this assumption. Now, we don't have to worry about this assumption because for most problems that you would, you would solve in your life, this assumption would be satisfied. But certainly, like, I'm not sure in what situation you would have a condition where you have like isolated points that are not part of the constraint set. And these isolated points are at the boundary. So then you may get into trouble by using barrier method, but we won't worry about those situations. You have a question? No. Okay. So uh, we'll talk about barrier methods next Monday. You have midterms on, uh, on Wednesday, so good luck with that. And there will be fall break after that, so have a great break. And then I'll see you guys on, on Monday of next week. Thank you.